Well, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about exotic functional data structures, and specifically we're going to be talking about hitchhiker trees. Um, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, my name is David Greenberg. Um, I'm an author. There's this book I wrote. I'm an engineer, and now I actually consult working mostly on Mesos and distributed systems problems. Um, and also, just a, a little announcement, um, at 12.30 today, I'll be signing and giving away copies of this book, Building Applications on Mesos. Um, so let's get started, though. There's a lot to cover here, because functional data structures are uh, pretty complicated. So what are functional data structures? Well, at their core, a functional data structure is immutable. That's really the difference between a functional data structure and a regular data structure. So what does immutable mean? Well, consider seven. When we add one to seven, we get eight. But the thing is, seven is still seven. If you think about what does an array do, or a list or something, or a map, in most languages, when you, you, know, when you add an element to that, that's not what happens. So let's look at some examples in Python, just to sort of build some intuition about what a functional data structure actually is. So here we have a Python program where we define this list, x, and x has three elements. And then we say that y is equal to x, and we add a new element to y. Um, now, this program prints that I'm a sad panda. Now, why is that? Well, it's because when we added the element to y, we also kind of added it to x by mistake. Now, when we look at the program, it doesn't look like we added it to x. It looks like we added it to y. You know, but this is how it goes without functional data structures. How do we fix this? Well, I made a little change to the program. Um, if it's not jumping out to you, I'll highlight it here. Um, and what this changes is this little sigil, it actually copies the list x. So now we're not saying that y is equal to x. We're saying that y is a copy of x. And so now when we, when we compare these two lists, having added a new element to y, we see that they are different. And so we can be a happy panda. Um, and so that's great, right? This, this basic idea of copying, it turns out it's going to be really important. So here's a list of fruit. Um, maybe these are my favorite fruit. Uh, they're not, actually, because I don't really like apples that much. So how would I mutate this list to, be, to represent my favorite fruit? I don't like apples, but I kind of like mangoes instead. So we just are going to copy the list, um, which is in red, and then we're going to make a new one, which is green. So for the rest of this talk, whenever I put data structures up on slides, I'm going to highlight them so that anything in black hasn't changed, anything in red has been deallocated, and anything in green has been allocated or mutated, just to sort of get a feeling for where we're, where we're spending um, our cost of allocations and deallocations. So what we can see here, what's going on, is that we've, when we copied this list, it's in the process of copying is when we actually made the change. So the old list in red, that's still the exact same list that it was before, kind of like how 7 doesn't change when you add 1 to it. You just get another thing, which is 8. You know, that's what we have going on here. We have the old one on the left and the new one on the right. Now, this isn't super great, though, because we did have to copy the entire list. So in order to do better, we're going to have to introduce a new concept, which is pointers, um, also known as references in a lot of languages. Now, most languages use these, and you're probably familiar with them, but maybe you haven't encountered them. So let's just talk a little more about them. So here we have a struct. Um, and this is a struct kind of with like biometric information about me. You know, it has my name in the first field. It has my occupation, my hair color, my eye color. Um, and the thing that I want to point out here is that my name in the first field, that's actually, that's like a, an embedded struct. So inside of this record with four fields, the first field is actually a, new, is a different record with two fields, but we've embedded them together. So this is one way to represent data, but we could also represent it with a pointer. So by representing this data with a pointer, what we can do is we can take that, that name that with the first name and the last name, and we can move that off to a different place in memory. And instead of storing the full name embedded in my biometric struct, I can just point to it with that little arrow. So also, throughout this talk, whenever we have pointers or pointer fields, um, the one thing that's always going to be in common is there's always going to be angle brackets around them, um, just to kind of help you visually distinguish between actual values and pointers. OK, so what's the point of pointers? Well, pointers enable sharing. So what we can do is, if we have something else, say an employee record on the bottom left, then we can have a biometrics record and an employee record. They can share the same name record. So this sharing is really, is really kind of an interesting thing. So let's explore how is pointers and sharing, or pointers which enable sharing, how is that related to functional data structures? You know, how can that actually help us? 
So if we go back to our example, where we have our, our struct where we had to, when we wanted to modify it, make an entirely new copy, which forced us to make a whole new allocation and deallocate the entire old um, array, how can we do better? So we're going to do better by using a linked list. So this is a singly linked list, and this is a functional singly linked list, so we're going to have to treat it slightly differently, because there's no more mutation allowed. So suppose I want to mutate this linked list, right? I want to change it so that instead of having an apple at the front, we want to have a mango at the front. So what we do is just this. And what we've done here is we have, by, because this, the last four elements are the same for the old linked list and the new linked list, we only had to allocate and deallocate the first element, right? So by only changing the first element, this actually saves us a lot of computational resources, a lot of, of, of kind of memory allocation and deallocation, because we only had to now allocate and deallocate one element instead of five. So this is better, OK? Now, the problem is that in the worst case, this, this actually gets pretty bad. In fact, it gets linear in the number of elements in the list. So here, in this case, instead, I want to I say, you know, it's not that I like, I actually changed my mind. I like apples, but I'm not a big fan of bananas. So we're going to say, instead of bananas, I like mangoes. And so to do this, I actually had to change the first three elements we had to deallocate and allocate new ones. OK, so now there's something weird going on here. Maybe you're, you're wondering, why, why three? Because the first two elements are the same. And so this is, this is actually, it's a philosophical thing, but it's practical as well. And so the question is this. When is an apple not an apple? In this case, I'm referring to the apple at the head of each list. Well, an apple that points to an orange that points to a banana is different than an apple that points to an orange that points to a mango. Um, yeah, so what, is that, what does that mean? Well, when we think about pointers, right, remember pointers are just kind of a different way of representing embedding information into a struct, but instead we're just pointing to it so that it can be shared. But really, that apple and, and orange at the beginning of the list, those are different apples and oranges because when we sort of trace down what their descendants look like, their descendants are different. And so this idea um, you know, of, of what, is the, what is something, why do we have to copy it versus not, versus be able to leave it in place and share it, this is an important question that we're going to revisit for, you know, continuously throughout this talk. Um, so this idea here, what we're doing is we're copying the path. And the path is we're tracing from the thing that we want to mutate, we're tracing it all the way back to the root of the data structure. The root is something which nothing points to it, and that's what makes it the root. So we had to copy this entire path to the root. Of course, in this case, copying the entire path could be the whole list. And so we need to do better. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do better by using trees. Um, now, we're going to talk about a bunch of different types of trees. We're going to build up to hitchhiker trees, because they have a lot of kind of tricks in them. So we're going to talk about binary search trees, and then we're going to talk about B trees and B plus trees, and then fractal trees, and then hitchhiker trees, because each one's going to kind of build on top of them as it gets more and more complex. So we'll start with binary search trees. Binary search trees, why are they called this? Well, binary, because there are two children for each node. They're search trees because they're sorted, um, which enables us to do a search. Now, the sort that they do, you look at this and you say, you know, David, that doesn't, that doesn't look really sorted to me. You know, it kind of looks like you scattered um, elements throughout it randomly. Well, the sort that this tree and all trees are going to use is for any node, all children to the left of it are less, all children to the right of it are greater. And so we can see this property is true. So if we want to look up the value 3 in the tree, I've highlighted, whenever I um, want to just call attention to something, we'll make it orange, OK? Um, no more colors. So when we highlight it, we're going we're to look up 3, right? So we say, well, where is 3? And we look at the root. Well, root is 4, and we know 3 is less than 4, so we can descend to the left. And then we say, OK, well, now we're on 2. We know, two is, we know 3 is greater than 2. And so we go to the right, and lo and behold, we find three. So the thing about this is the lookups are log base two of n. So I want to give you some intuition about how we're actually going to come up with these big O runtimes, because as we go into B trees and B plus trees and fractal trees and hitchhiker trees, they're each doing tricks to sort of manipulate the big O runtime in funky ways. And it, I think it, it really helps to make sure we're all on the same page about where this log base two of n is coming from. So if we count the number of elements in each level, on the first level, which, because we're computer scientists who don't use MATLAB or Lua, is indexed 0, we say, well, there's 2 to the 0 elements 
in the first level. And so that's one element. And of course, there's one element, it's the root. And on the second level, um, which is index one, there's two to the one elements, and you know, there are. And on the third level, there's two to the second power elements, and, and so on and so on. We would keep increasing that number. Now, in big O analysis, we only care about the dominating factor. That is, the, the, the term of our equation that is the growing biggest fastest. And so in our case, what's growing biggest fastest? It's the number of leaves in the tree. The, number, the leaves are the bottom elements of the tree. So that's what's growing biggest fastest. And so that's what we're going to do the analysis based on. So let's do a little algebra. I'm sorry, um, but let's, you know, let's kind of walk through this and see how this works. So we have L levels in the tree. Um, this is just sort of, you know, by definition. We have a tree, we count it, how many levels there are, however many levels there are, that's L. Okay. Now we know that lookups cost L. Hopefully I convinced you um, when we went through that little example of looking up three that whenever we look up a value in a tree, we're always going to see that it is L levels deep. Now, the other thing is that only the last level matters. I tried to give some, some intuition into why that's the case, um, you know, and I think that if you want to know, if you don't believe me, and it seems a little bit hand-wavy, it is a little hand-wavy, um, and there's definitely a lot more rigorous ways to, to convince yourself of this. Okay, so there's also, there's two to the L minus one elements in the last level. All right, so now we have some terms that we can work with. So if N is the number of elements in the last level, then n is equal to 2 to the, to the l minus 1, uh, because we're just kind of plugging definitions into each other. So now we do some algebra. You've got to trust me, this is how algebra works. Um, and we get that log base 2 of n is equal to l. So what is l? l is the number of levels we have in the tree, and l is the cost of doing a lookup in the tree. So if l is the cost of a lookup in the tree, then log base 2 of n is the cost of the lookup in the tree. Now, the other thing that I just want to point out here, because it's going to matter, is um, that we had, we used 2 to the L minus 1 because there was two children at each level. And that 2 is the same 2 that got copied down to the subscript on that log, so log base 2. So we're going to play with this stuff um, in, in a little while when we start talking about B trees and B plus trees. Okay. So functional updates. So I've talked about trees, I've uh, talked about these binary search trees, but I haven't talked about a functional binary search tree. You know, what does it mean to be functional? Well, we're going to take that path copying idea from the linked lists, and it turns out path copying works way better with trees. So here is an example where we want, well, we, what we're going to do here is we're going to change the node which had three, and we're going to change it to be 3.14, which is similar to pi. Um, so what we have is we actually need to only deallocate that path from the root to three, and we're allocating this new path um, from the root to 3.14. And what you can see, though, is that actually a bunch of the nodes are staying black. We don't actually need to change those nodes. We don't need to touch them because from their perspective, their subtrees have not changed whatsoever. They're exactly the same. And what's cool about this is that the updates are still log base 2 of n. Now, I want you to think about that just for a second here again. The updates for a functional tree are the same cost as the updates for a mutable tree, asymptotically anyway. So this is pretty exciting, right? We can actually start, we're seeing a way that we can take functional data structures and get the same performance that we would get out of a mutable data structure. There's a few other properties of trees that, um, that are worth knowing about um, and that we're not going to talk about in this talk. So trees are balanced, right? One of the things we're going to assume throughout, um, that we've been assuming, we're going to continue to assume, is that our trees are balanced, which means that there's, you know, they're sort of uh, triangular with kind of a flat bottom and, and sloping sides. They're not leaning heavily to one direction. They're not sort of like a line that just you know, squiggles off into the bottom right or bottom left distance. Um, how do we maintain this? Uh, there's some algorithms that do this. There's sort of two big families of them. If you're interested in learning about that, there's a book called CLRS. The CLRS book is kind of the canonical book of writing about how algorithms work. So if you want to learn about tree balancing, you could read CLRS or you could try Wikipedia. Um, the other question is, how do we actually order the values? Well, in this talk, we're only going to be talking about sorted trees, uh, because these are what are, have been interesting to me, and these are kind of what all these trees we're talking about take advantage of. There is another way to order the values in a tree, though, um, and that way to order them is called a try, which is also pronounced a tree. That's that word where the first E is an I um, up there. So a try is out of scope, but I want to point them out because 
the same stuff we're going to talk about, the same performance optimizations we're going to talk about, in most cases apply to tries. And that's actually the way that languages like Scala, Clojure, and Elixir, that's how they implement their immutable hash maps, is they use tries instead of trees. And if we have some time at the end, I do have a couple bonus slides about how that's actually done. We'll see. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is, is what if we change our cost model? So where did that 2 come from in the log base 2 of n? Well, that 2 came from the number of children that we had to go to, right? There was two children as a binary search tree. Now, the thing that we're trying to optimize in that tree, if we all, another way to think about that is, what was that cost that we were looking at, that height? Well, at each level, we needed to do a comparison. And so what actually, the, the sort of the cost model that a binary search tree is evaluated under is the comparison cost model. We're trying to count how many times do we have to check whether we're greater than, less than, or equal to. Each time we do that, we, that's sort of the thing we're counting up. So what if we change our cost model to I.O.? What if instead we say that, you know, well, it turns out that things like, and if we want to read data from a disk, we're probably getting 4K of data at a time, or maybe a megabyte of data at a time. It's actually no more efficient to read one byte versus 1,000 bytes when we're reading it off of you know, a disk. And if we're reading it over a network, that number could get even bigger. You know, it could be a megabyte or two megabytes. So let's try a new idea. What if we actually increase the number of children per level? Because comparisons aren't really expensive. We can do a bunch of comparisons inside of every node. Instead, what let's do is let's try to make it so that each node carries as much data as possible. OK, and we're going to do that by making fat nodes with B children. That B stands for branching factor. And that B is for B trees. So here's an image of a B tree. And if we look at this B tree, we see, OK, it's a tree. Uh, you know, kind of ran out of space because these B trees, they have this you know, branching factor that's really big. Um, and the text gets too small if I try to show more levels. Uh, so here, what we see is we look at the root. And we see, OK, the root has some values like 5, 10, 15, and 20. And it turns out that same sorting property is true in this as it is in the, in the binary search tree. So let's look at that, right? If we look, the first element in the root is 5. And so if we look at the very leftmost leaf, we see that all those values are less than 5. In fact, they're from 1 to 4. And if we look at the, all the other leaves, we see those are all greater. So what we've sort of done is we've sort of taken that binary search tree, and we've kind of scrunched up a few levels of that tree. We've kind of scrunched them up into just one node. So these B trees, they're, they're great, actually. They're really great. They're optimal for reads. Um, there's a lower bound of log base B of n on lookups and sorted data. And that's way beyond the scope of this talk to prove. I don't even remember how you prove it. But let's just take it as a given that that's, that's going to be our bound, OK? So it's really cool, though, that we can control the base of the logarithm. You know, with these binary search trees, we were stuck with always being log base 2 of n. With B trees, we're log base B of n. And so, you know, why is that cool? So suppose we had a tree with 1,000 elements, and it's a binary search tree. Well, in that case, we're going to spend, you know, about 10 units of time when we want to do a lookup in this tree. OK, well, that's cool. You know, 10 units of time seems reasonable, especially if they're small units. But what if we go to that B tree on the previous slide you know, with, um, with five children? Uh, well, when we only have five children, we're actually going to be able to nearly double the performance. So we just increase the number of children, and now we get a constant factor speed up. And then again, you know, what if we wanted you know, an even bigger B tree, say 100 th children per node? Well, now we're nearly seven times faster than the binary search tree. And the reason is that our speed, it's not coming from the number of comparisons we're doing. It's coming from the amount of data we have to read from disks. And so this B tree is allowing us to read more data, more useful data that we can act on on every single time we do I.O. And so this is great. By going wide, we get these big, constant speed ups for free. And this is because of this I.O. cost model. Now, I want to point out these speed ups, they are constant speed ups. You know, we're not getting some kind of asymptotic performance improvement. But still, you know, is anybody would be happy if their program was 100 times faster just for free? Yeah, you know, sure. It's not, it doesn't get even faster when you run more data, but you know, I'm not going to say no. So B-tree bookkeeping, though, uh, you know, there, there is a downside with B-trees. Or there's something that I find personally annoying with implementing B-trees, which is that the bookkeeping is, is quite a bit trickier. And the reason is that each one of those nodes, we don't have that easy to express invariant of, oh, yeah, well, you know, if it's smaller, it goes to the left. And if it's bigger, it goes to the right. Instead, we have this thing where, oh, well, we have, you know, 
k elements on each, or on each level, and then we have you know, k plus one children, and they have this particular property, and good luck figuring that out. Uh, it can be kind of challenging. And so there's this idea that a lot of people had, you know, saying, well, you know, if that's kind of annoying to implement. What if, we, what if we separated node types, actually? What if we, instead of storing data throughout the tree, what if we only store data at the leaves? And we'll call those the data nodes. And then we only store index information in the middle and the root, and we'll call those index nodes. Now, the other, the other kind of cool thing about doing this is, you know, throughout this talk, we're only looking at the keys in the tree. But remember, often maps are kind of what we care about, not sets. And so along with each of those numeric keys, there's some value associated with it that's just sitting there. And so when we change our tree and we separate the index and the data nodes, values only need to be stored in data nodes, because the index nodes are just storing those keys. And the keys are probably smaller, so you can fit more keys per level. So this is another performance enhancement that people get. And now, what is this called you know, we've, that we've been talking about, this idea of separating the index and the data nodes? Well, that's a B plus tree. And so here we can see a B plus tree. It looks similar to the B tree. You know, it's got children. Um, it's got index nodes. Uh, but the difference here is, is what I've done is said, OK, the root doesn't store any data. Instead, it's just sort of replicating the largest value from that child up. So you can see that the first element of the root is the largest value from the first child, 4. And the second one is 8, and so on. Um, and the last one is plus. And the reason it's plus is that that just means this is bigger than anything else. You know, we, we don't care what it is, but the really big stuff goes over in this direction. And so we create this sort, and you know, our lookups are still going to work the same. So if we want to look up the value 9, we scan across the root until we find um, the first index element, which is going to be greater than 9, which is 12. And then we go down a level, and we look in that node, and you know, there's 9. Now, for the, for the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to reduce B kind of pathologically. There's only going to be three children for each node. And the reason is I want to show three-level trees, because as we start talking about fractal trees and hitchhiker trees, their optimizations and their improvements uh, really depend on multiple levels of the tree existing, because we're kind of going to get some performance optimizations and performance wins by increasing the number of levels, or, or by taking advantage of the fact that there are many levels. So from now on, we're going to have these three-level trees, and so here's our three-level B tree. All right. So fractal trees. Now we're getting to the good stuff, you know, what you really maybe came here to hear about, fractal trees and hitchhiker trees. So what is a fractal tree? Well, this is a fractal tree. The difference between this and a B plus tree, I'm pointing right here. It's this, it's this idea that each one of the nodes is going to get a little buffer attached to it. You can see here, this fractal tree has buffers of size 2. So it's a B plus tree with extra buffers added to all the index nodes. So a fractal tree, just to say it again, a fractal tree is a B plus tree, but we're putting this buffer, this log, this place we can store data temporarily, we're putting that on every one of the index nodes. So in order to understand what this is about, well, I want to make a little aside. OK, off of trees, let's go back to something simpler and different. Because you know what? That, that log base B of n, that was only for sorted lookups, right? And inserting into a tree is not a sorted lookup. I mean, it's, it's inserting, not lookup. It's different. So we can do better. And how we can do better is by appending to a log. Now, appending to a log is a constant time operation. So supposing that we have this log here, and we're going to append in the direction of the arrow, then we always know the next index where we need to insert it before we even do the insertion. There's, there's no bookkeeping. Just, inc well, there's just incrementing a number tells us where to insert it. So we want to insert our first element at index 0. And because we inserted that element at index 0, we know the next element belongs at index 1. And we know the next one belongs at index 2, and the next one at index 3, and the last one is going to belong at index 4. We didn't have to think about that. There was no tree balancing. There was no complex algorithm to do this. It was really fast to just append to the log. And so when we consider a fractal tree, you know, this is what we're going to take advantage of, is that each of these little buffers that we stuck on the index nodes, each of those little logs, those are going to be really fast to insert into. And we're going to take advantage of that to sort of smooth out the performance of our B plus trees insertions. So let's start. We insert 0 into this tree. And we stuck 0 right there, right in the root node. Why do we stick it there? Because that insertion of 0, there was space for it in the buffer up there. 
And the other thing that I want to point out, I want to highlight here, is that we only even had to touch the root node. We literally don't even care what the rest of the tree is doing or what's going on. This, is, this operation costed one. It's only one thing we touched. It's very, very efficient. So let's insert another element, negative one. And once again, it fits in the buffer in the root node. We only have to touch the root node. And so this is already better than what a B plus tree would require, which would be at least touching one node at every level. So now let's insert a new value, 28. So I want you to think for a second, you know, we're going to insert 28. What might happen? You know, where are those values going to go? Because we don't have space in that buffer anymore. All right, time's up. So what we're going to do is insert that. We still want to insert that in the root, but what we have to do first is to free up that space. And we're freeing up the space by flushing those values down. And so here you can see that those values, when they get flushed, they're going to the left. All right, they're going down to the, to the left uh, level. And the reason for that is if you think about where would we like to insert those if this wasn't a fractal tree, well, we would insert them all the way on the bottom left, sorry, bottom left of the... Uh, of the tree. And that's because they are the smallest elements, right? They're even smaller than the current smallest elements of the tree. So they belong in that direction. So we're going to flush them down in that direction. And after we flush them down, that frees up space in our root buffers. And so we can do a new insertion. So we'll keep going. You know, we'll insert 29. That, again, fits in the root. We're back to our situation where we only have to touch one node. And we'll insert negative 2 which is, you know, also great. We're going to flush 28 and 29 down, this time to that side. And, you know, they fit. And we have new space in the root again. We're going to insert 11.5. And now at this point, I just want to pause for a second and say, at this point, something interesting is going to happen on our, on our next insertion. Because 11.5 can go to the middle node, right? There's space for it there. But negative 2, that's going to be going, that's going to be going over to the left. And so, it doesn't really fit though, right? We, we, negative one and zero are over in the left buffer, so where do they go? Well, when we insert this, this additional value, what happens is we're gonna have to flush, but we're gonna flush recursively, right? So actually flushing is always a recursive operation in a fractal tree. And so what we ended up doing here was negative one and zero, they got flushed so far down that they became a leaf of the tree. In fact, the way that fractal trees are implemented is that they actually are just going to, at that point, trigger the standard B plus tree insertion algorithm. OK, so this is how these writes work. It's this idea of we have these buffers. We fill up the buffers. When a buffer fills up, we flush it down to the next level recursively until we find enough space. And when it hits the bottom, that's when we actually insert it into the tree like we normally would with a B plus tree. And so this is a fractal tree. And it gives us this big improvement in write performance. Now, what about reads, though? You know, it's not so obvious how we're actually going to read this data because it's not, the, the trees aren't really in sorted order anymore. Well, let's look at a different tree, a simpler tree, to get an example of how we can do a read. So here we have a super simple uh, fractal tree, almost nothing going on in it. And we want to look up 20. So to look up a value in a fractal tree, there's actually, it's, it's actually a two-step process. So the first thing we do is we find the path that we want to do that lookup you know, th so that we can do that lookup. The same kind of path finding that we did for the binary search trees and the B trees and the B plus trees. We're finding this path of all the nodes along the path. And then what we do, and this is the cool part, is we're going to project the pending operations. So just to highlight that, right, we're taking every one of the pending operations that was along that path that we did the lookup on, and we're going to project them all down into that leaf node. Essentially, it turns out, even for a fractal tree, which is mutable, we still need to use functional data structures for this part of the operation, because we, do, we want to make sure that we're, we're not actually changing the tree, but in order to do the lookup, we have to pretend like we're changing the tree. So it's kind of like we have our old node value, which hasn't changed over here, but then we have to create the simulated new value. Okay. So once we do this simulation of the new value um, of the new leaf, then now we can actually do the lookup directly on the leaf. And you know, we, we do our little search within that single leaf. We see 20 is there, and we get our answer. So this logic here, this is broken for scans. Okay? So a scan is another common uh, operation we want to do on sorted trees. And a scan just says, you know, let's start from all values that are greater than something and less than something. You know, it's, it's the subrange. It's, it's, we're scanning across a bunch of stuff. And so this is broken for scans, 
right? Because if we project the pending operations on each path to every node, then, for instance, we can see that the roots pending operations are going into every single node, right? It's kind of crazy. And so we end up with, with you know, gems of our sorted tree. It's definitely sorted when it goes, you know, 14, 20, 30, 15, uh, 14, 20, 30, 10, 15, right? That's definitely sorted order. So, okay, so it turns out it's actually slightly more complex. What we do is we actually only project values within range. So for a fractal tree and for a hitchhiker tree, what we're going to end up doing is we actually have to figure out um, which operations might end up in that leaf and then project only those operations. It's a little bit more complex implementation-wise, but when we're thinking about it, you know, just this idea of projecting the path of all the pending operations is what allows us to actually get good results, correct results, um, in, our, in our fractal tree reads. So I've been talking a lot about fractal trees, and maybe you're wondering, okay, but I thought this talks about hitchhiker trees, what's the deal, you know, what's going on here? So the, one of the big differences between a hitchhiker tree and a fractal tree is whether or not it's using path copying. So fractal trees, they do update in place. They, they're similar to a B plus tree or a B tree or whatever, you know, in that they're actually designed to be making these modifications and mutations in place. And when we look at commercial fractal trees, they typically take advantage of this in order to expose different types of concurrency in their operations um, in a way that is completely incompatible with a functional data structure. In comparison, a hitchhiker tree one of the most fundamentally important differences is that a hitchhiker tree uses path copying so that a hitchhiker tree is a functional and immutable data structure that still is able to, to gain these performance advantages of the faster inserts and um, the better I.O. performance. Another difference between the two of them um, that is not something that we can really have time to go into in this talk is that hitchhiker trees are more optimized for um, storage, which returns bigger amounts of data that's with, at higher latency, whereas fractal trees are, are, have really been optimized for things like solid state disks and local disks, where there's a slightly different performance trade-off in latency and, um, and size of block. So let's look at something else, though, okay? Let's talk about flush control. This is another thing that's really important with a hitchhiker tree in terms of understanding where, where you're actually gaining performance. So I have this, um, this example, again, of the B plus tree slash fractal tree slash hitchhiker tree and all the insertions that we made. And there were seven, seven operations is what we did. Okay. So, and we have this table as well. And each row is the IO, is IO costs for a type of tree. And each column, each represent a different thing. So the total IO, that's, that's what it sounds like. It's the total number of IO operations that were done to do seven inserts. The IOs per flush, that is, looking at each flush, each time you flushed the tree, how many IOs did you do? And then lastly, the average IO per insert, that's the total IO divided by seven, because we're averaging it out, right? It's not necessarily the max IOs we did at a single time that is sort of the worst case pause when we did a write. Instead, we're saying what was sort of the average when we averaged it out. And so for a B plus tree, you know, every time we do an insert, we have to touch every level of the tree to get all the way down. And let's assume that we want to persist those to disk. And so that means we're also doing three IOs every time we flush, because we have to write those out every single time. And so, of course, this gives us an average of three IOs uh, per insert. Now, for a fractal tree, we only had to do 12 IOs. Remember, because those 12 IOs, sometimes when we didn't insert, we only had to touch the root. So the IOs per flush, they could be only one. But in the worst case, remember when we inserted 100 in that last insertion, that actually caused us to have to write four nodes. That's even more. That's an even worse pause than what the B plus tree caused us to do. So the IOs per flush can be highly variable with a fractal tree. And then, but the, on average, you know, we actually end up doing a lot better, almost twice better than what we got with the B plus tree by using the fractal tree. And that's because we did end up doing a much fewer IOs overall because we, um, we were able to, we didn't have to touch every level of the tree every time. So with a hitchhiker tree, we can do even better. Um, and with the hitchhiker tree, what we're doing is we actually only have to do five IOs overall. And the reason is we could actually just make the decision to not flush until we've made a whole bunch of writes. And so in this case, we only have one flush, which costs five IOs, but it only happened once. So the latency on that flush is quite a bit longer. But also, in addition to, to in, in exchange for, for that increased latency, our IOs per insert is less than one IO per insert. That's, that's pretty great. 
So the other thing I do want to point out, though, is that with a hitchhiker tree and with its API and also with a fractal tree, it's really up to you when you want to flush. So you kind of have this, this trade-off space of you can choose to flush more often and spend more on I.O. costs or flush less, less often and save on I.O. costs at the expense of you know, not having your data written to a disk somewhere. So real branching factors, all right? It turns out that you know, in these examples, we've been looking at stuff with three or five or six children, but that's not, really, that's not really how many children there are supposed to be. That's not really how many there are. A B plus tree typically has a fan out of one to 2,000 elements. All right, and the reason is that, remember, when we talked about what is the sort of the block size of, of most disks, it could be anywhere from four kilobytes to one megabyte. Well, we can easily fit that many keys into a single node, so the branching factor for a B plus tree is pretty big. So you might think the branching factor for a hitchhiker tree would also be pretty big. And it, it isn't, strangely. It's actually much less, maybe 100, 200, could be even less. So why is that? Well, it's because those buffers in the hitchhiker tree, those actually end up being really huge. Because remember, the thing that, we, that often we care about, and this is a trade-off that we can make, is we, we often care about increasing our insertion time. We want, to re we want to increase the performance when we're doing operations on the tree, when we're doing writes to the tree. We want to, and then we're OK with maybe having a small penalty on reads. And so there's actually a um, Wikipedia article about this, I believe, um, where they, they show some math again, um, kind of complex or whatever, and they actually end up getting better than log base um, log base B of N for operations on fractal trees because the buffers are so big. And there's, there's various ways you can try to tune this and what have you. Okay, so you know, maybe you're thinking, this is kind of cool, this is interesting. I'd like to try these fractal trees, these hitchhiker trees. I want to play with them. Well, it's on GitHub, and it's available as part of the Datacrypt project. So Datacrypt is entirely written in Clojure, and it's entirely pluggable. And when I say it's pluggable, I mean it's pluggable in all kinds of ways. The backend storage is pluggable. Initially, I implemented a Redis backend and an in-memory backend, but we've since had contributions for database backends and for S3 as a backend. Um, the I.O. management layer is pluggable, so when you want to flush, uh, when you want to compress data, all of that is up to you for how you want to actually do that, and you can write plugins for changing that. The serialization format's pluggable. Again, this allows you to control things like com um, compression and encryption in order to get additional performance gains there. And even the sorting algorithm is pluggable. So you can use the default you know, JVM sort, or you can use a, um, an ordinal sort or a lexicographic sort, or really whatever sort function you want to use. It's all uh, pluggable with Datacrypt. And what Datacrypt gives you is it gives you this, this framework, this API, for interacting with a hitchhiker tree uh, in a very fundamental way so you can insert things into it, you can delete things from it, you can um, flush it to disk and, and do a variety of, of cache management operations. I mentioned briefly that the hitchhiker tree, as compared to the fractal tree, um, is designed for remote storage, storage even further away, reading even bigger amounts of data. And so there's a bunch of cache management functionality that it supports for that. And so right now, today, you can actually use this also in an application. Um, it works with Redis, and it's called the Outboard API. So what is the Outboard API? Well, it looks like a hash map, um, except the data is stored off heap in Redis, which is a major innovation, obviously, compared to Redis. Uh, so it, and it, you know, it actually is, though. It's, it's not the same thing as Redis, because although Redis is an off heap hash map to you know, pretty much, um, what the hitchhiker tree adds is it's a functional data structure, so you have free snapshots. So no matter how much data you're storing in Redis, you can actually, as you make modifications, you can say, oh, actually, snap this and preserve this map, and that's free. And so what that means, though, is that in addition to having all these snapshots that you can make whenever you want to at basically zero cost, um, you have this still this advantage of your functional program when you need to restart the virtual machine. It can just reconnect to Redis, and you can be right off to the races. And this is a really interesting idea, and this is something that actually inspired me to start thinking about these in the first place, which is that once, when we're writing functional programs, we're building these functional systems, we don't actually have to tie the lifetime of our data structures to the lifetime of our runtime, which means that as we're redeploying code, as we're making changes, as we're doing those kinds of things, restarting our virtual machine doesn't mean we need to actually flush out our memory. It doesn't mean we need to get rid of all of that state we've accumulated in memory, and that means that we can do restarts much faster, and that's pretty exciting. 
So I want to give some um, shout outs and thanks to Andy Chambers for contributing the JDBC backend for the hitchhiker trees and also for improving the, the way that we do garbage collection. And also to Casey Marshall for contributing the S3 backend. So, you know, I think the big question now is what are we going to build next? Um, I would, you know, love to have anyone or everyone as a contributor to the hitchhiker trees on GitHub at the DataCrypt project. I don't think we have any time for Q&A, so thank you.